thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we are on um, session three, um, part three, session three, okay. Um, I will quickly introduce our um, two speakers um, because as everyone has been telling you, you have their full bios and the abstract of their papers in the package that you got. So, um, so we don't spend more time uh, away from the actual um, subject. Um, we will have two speakers um, uh, uh, for this session. Isabelle Delacorte, who is an art historian and independent scholar with a background in academia, gallery management, and advisory services. And uh, Cerebri Moses, who is a curator, an author, and an adjunct faculty at Art History Hunter College and a visiting faculty at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard Col College. With that, I'm going, you know, please, Isabel, start. I'm going to time you. Thank you Madam. Yes, thank you. We have, you have 30 minutes. I also need to run on a website ready to run. You need a website? Yes. Okay, so let me, is it in there? Is, do you have No, the, no, no. Diane, um, let me just, um, what should I call you when I'm um, the time? Well, I can just open. But I'll, should I just take this yeah. here at the moment, and then and you yeah. can just and then I just do that. Too. Yes. So just let me just. Sense. Yes. This one you just do this. Yeah. This is here. Okay. Well, you can call. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so the topic of my talk today is about uh, Beirut, and unlike Zena, and I want to thank you, Zena, for your talk before. I'm not Lebanese, so maybe I'm even less legitimate to talk about it. But I think what is very important is to bear witness to what's happening right now. Uh, when I uh, submitted my abstract to Hamid, I thought that the blast in August 2020 would be the last catastrophic event in Beirut. Uh, sadly, uh, current events have just proved that I was wrong. And uh, the artist, I'm going to show you uh, five different, different uh, artistic practices. And to them, it's just very important that they can be heard, actually, uh, no matter the voice. So I'm not going into a lot of uh, art theory. I'm just going to disclose um, as precise as possible uh, these practices. On the 4th of August 2020, of a warehouse full of ammoni ammonium nitrates detonated at the port of Beirut, resulting in one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in contemporary history. The blast claimed the lives of at least 280 people, injured 7,000 people, and caused extensive damage across the city. Streets were filled with shattered glass, hindering both traffic and emergency response efforts. Since the incident, Lebanese authorities have actively obstructed the investigation into the blast, continuing a long-standing culture of impunity that has persisted in Lebanon since the official end of the war in 1990. In the days following the explosion in Beirut Harbor, Fairu's song, Liberut, resonated like a national anthem. Sorry. Yeah, but excuse me. I'm going to read it while we try to fix it. Um, so the song says, she, Beirut, is wine from the spirit of the people of Lebanon, from its sweat of a people. This is bread and jasmine. So how did its taste become the taste of fire and smoke? And of quote. To the Lebanese singer, Beirut is both her past and future. 
despite the persistent conditions of loss, violence and destruction that have plagued the city since the 1970s. Released in 1984, Feru's song captures the essence of his struggle, turning personal and collective grief into a poignant artistic expression. The lyrics, reflecting on the transformation of Beirut from a place of beauty to one marked by fire and smoke, echoes the sentiments found in many contemporary artworks. This paper embarks on a journey through several Lebanese slash Palestinian art artistic practices, spanning time and geography, echoing the city's history while trying to guess its future. Historically a pivotal crossroad, Beirut remains intri intricately intertwined with complex geopolitical dynamics of the MENA area. I will examine a range of artistic responses to the city's history, starting with Munira al Sol installation uh, at the 2020 Venice uh, Biennale this year, for those who have not uh, seen it. This installation called Phoenicia, a dance with a myth, retraces the links between history, mythology, and the past civilization of Phoenicians. While Lamia Jerej's participation to the last uh, Istanbul Biennale with uncertain times, mapping and transformation, delves into the anxieties of living in a city with such a turbulent past and an uncertain future. Marwan Reshmawi Gallery 2020 and Jill Berhaj, Reality in the Real, served as immediate reaction to the 2020 blast, capturing the raw emotions of artists and cultural actors in the chaos that followed. Finally, Abdulrahman Katanani's Olive Tree, which was a little bit um, before in 2015 and 2017 and still an ongoing series, reflects on the scars of the past of the city's ability to regenerate and grow. Through their respective mediums, these artworks navigate themes of memory, identity, and the lingering effects of conflict, providing a nuanced perspective on the complexities of traumatic layers of resilience in Beirut. Phoenicia, a dance with her myth, is the installation of 41 works by Munira Asol, presented at the Lebanese pavilion of the Venice Biennale this year. Uh, in order to exist, this pavilion has to be privately funded. This should not come as a surprise since, since most artistic initiatives in Lebanon are private. Located in the Arsenale, it retraces the legend of Europa, a Phoenician princess who was abducted by Zeus, disguised as a bull, and brought to Creta, where he would rape her. Europa would later first give her name to the land stretching between Orient and Occident, and later to actual Europe. At first sight, a very colorful and uh, and um, joyful installation. Her piece consists of a boat, after destroyed or unfinished, as a central point, surrounded by several banners hanging from the ceiling, some ceramic masks, and a film. As a former shipyard, the Arsenal in Venice echoes the trading of Venetians with the trading of another former civilization, that of the Phoenicians. A Semitic maritime civilization, Phoenicia was primarily located on the shore of modern Lebanon between 1200 and 336 before BC, organized in city-states, of which the most known were Tyre, Sidon, and Byblos, they extended their influence across the Mediterranean. These traders, you see another view here, um, these traders and inventors are said to have invented the oldest alphabet. It is not rare in discussion with, uh, in Lebanon with people to overhear someone say that we are Phoenicians rather than Arabs, and uh, we might come, come back to this in the discussion. The artist shares a personal interpretation of Europe as classical myth, since mythology was done by men, for men, from a woman's point of view this time. Of a woman victim of a god, Munira is turning Europa into someone who with time succeeds in manipulating Zeus. She plays with his head like she would with a little balloon, you can see on the banner here. And even Hercules' dog is now a female dog. As the artist describes it, she wants, and I quote, to promote a relationship of equality between the sexes, rereading the myth through the eyes of, and the reflection of a woman of today, willing and free. End of quote. In a country where a woman cannot pass on her Lebanese citizenship to her children still in 2024, 
Alson's critical reading claims the parity condition, which is taking far too long to materialize. And you see also here the ceramic mask. and the drawings. Another artwork is from Lamia Jorej, and Lamia Jorej is known to feel first Beiruti before feeling uh, Lebanese, and she has long been integrating the city of Beirut into her artistic practice. On certain time, mapping a transformation uh, in 2022 was exhibited at the Istanbul Biennale uh, in September two years ago. It retraces the history of social and political transformation at the end of the Ottoman Empire, at the beginning of the English and French mandates following the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and about the Balfour Declaration, several turning points in the region's history. As we know, a century later, their historical, geopolitical, and, and social consequences are devastating. After five years of research, during which the artist was digging through several archives, not only in Lebanon, where archives are kept through and thanks to private initiatives, but also mostly in Nantes and Istanbul. Her use of archival documents tainted by fiction is a usual way of working to reflect on the region's history and its consequences, often starting with a personal aspect from a family past. In 2006, uh, in her film, uh, A Journey, uh, the film was triggered by her Palestinian grandmother's youth here, it is through the death of a Lebanese great-grandfather, Assad Daou, in 1916. This piece was also greatly influenced with several discussions Jorej had with a poet and artist, Etel Adnan, who was born during the French mandate for Syria and Lebanon, just after the collapse of the Ottoman world. Adnan, who according to today's geography had a Syrian father and a Greek mother, was an Arab poet who, instead of writing in Arabic, because she never learned Arabic, painted in Arabic, as she used to say. Uncertain times, mapping a transformation, consists of this huge historical freeze, the same process the artist used for underwriting Beirut in 2013 and the Living is Easy in 2016, collage of archival documents, letters, photographs, personal diaries, historical documents that the artists assembled together with their own drawings and annotations, with color-coded commentaries and translations. <laughs> Exhibited at the Pera Museum, this first version displays the migratory movement of Ottoman citizens trying to flee their military duties during the First World War by seeking opportunities elsewhere, also on the famine of Mount Lebanon and the Arab nationalist movements against the Ottoman power between 1913 and 1921. The first wall, the deadly fall of my great-grandfather, retraces the death of a, of, a, of a grandfather, who is thought to have slipped from a rock he had climbed to witness the invasion of locusts, which would provoke the great famine of Mount Lebanon in 1915, 1918, during which around 200,000 people, mostly Maronites, died of starvation. A further wall displays excerpts from a diary of Hissan Tojman, a 20 ish Palestinian soldier in 1918 who wonders about the fate of Palestine. He wrote in this diary, and I quote, but which will be the fate of Palestine? We all see two possibilities independence or annexion to Egypt. The latter is more likely, as only the British are likely to own the country, and it is unlikely that the British Empire would give full sovereignty to Palestine, but more likely that it would annex it to Egypt and create a single domination rule by the Khedif of Egypt." End of quote. Tragically assassinated in 1923, the author of this journal never knew how wrong his predictions were. For the Rej, this journal echoes so much the current situation of the entire region. A century later, she does not know what happened. She does know what happened and how wrong Tojman was. But if she transposes this situation today, and I quote her, it's because of that edge that I felt the need to go back to that historical moment. Because now we know what happened at the time. And when they study that moment at the time, when you look at his son's diary, he doesn't know what's going to happen to Palestine. He speculates. He thinks maybe Palestine will go to Egypt under the British. 
We're now at a point where we are constantly speculating what's going to happen to the region if the American and the Iranians sign an agreement. What's going to happen if the Russians leave Syria? End of quote. Georges thinks that by envisioning the past, she notices that there are as many conspiracy theories today about the future of a region than a century ago. Conspiracy theory that in the end look not different than pure speculation. We never know what tomorrow will bring. And you have a war with her, with her great grandfather um, portrait and the locust that she was uh, drawing. A further ex example, which is a very direct reaction to uh, the blast, is Marwan Rashmari's exhibition uh, in 2021 at the Gary Sphere Zemler. The Gary Sphere Zemler, located on the fourth floor of a building in the quarantine area, was completely destroyed by the explosion in the harbor. Uh, Marwan Rashmari Resh was the first artist to reopen the space in April 2021. His exhibition was supposed to open in 2020, was postponed due to the pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, during the explosion, his artworks were in the gallery, but kept in crates and did not suffer from the blast. The artist felt the urge to produce some in situ artworks, collecting destroyed materials and rubbles from the walls and the window frames of the gallery to combine new conceptual pieces, either hanging from the ceiling or as a floor installation. Rashmawi has also an extremely long reflection, artistic reflection on the city of Beirut, on its vulner vulnerability and resilience, on its long history of migration. So here you see the 600 kilos of metal from the wall, wall structures that he compressed into, into an element, and, uh, and the way also what you have on the walls and uh, hanging from the ceilings are the window frames. Rashmawi gives a direct, almost visceral reaction to the blast, the way the city was severely impacted in its core substance. As his artistic practice, he is examining the structure of, of a mapping of a city, like he did uh, many years ago. You have a detail here. Another one. And you probably know also uh, this artwork, which has been circulating quite a lot, which is uh, Beirut Caoutchouc from 2004, 2007, when you see actually a map of a city uh, made uh, in caoutchouc, um, in rubber, sorry. And I move to the next artist, uh, Gilbert Hage. Gilbert Hage is a photographer and he did this wonderful series of testimonies uh, for the Foundation for Art and Psychoanalysis uh, after the blast. So he gathered uh, cultural actors, uh, writers, artists, 27 people, and he filmed them asking them the same questions in Arabic and seeing how personal, how individual every testimony uh, could, be for, could become. So the question he was asking them was, what happened in Beirut's harbor on 4th August 2020? How have you been living since? What do you think of a saying that if evil disappeared from the world, 90% of the arts will disappear too? How do you see the future, your future as well as Lebanon's? Um, Haj is really trying to register a kind of uh, individual traumatic experience and also build an archive, an oral archive for the present and future generations. Um, although the questions are the same, their personal answers, depending on the language and their intellectual interest, make them quite different from each other. He filmed them, and you can see here my former colleague, uh, Tony Shakar. He filmed them in a very simple staging isolated against a neutral black background with a spot lightening their face, reminding of a police investigation. The result discloses, discloses anger and vulnerability. They pose, they look for their words, they breathe, and it makes it far too real and emotional. So I just trying to, sh I will just show you two very short uh, abstract of two of them, so Tony Shakar and Sharif Mashdalani, 
if you can maybe help me to get them um, online. Does it work? Yes. Like that? Ah, sorry. أربعة أب صار في انفجار هلا انفجار كنا ما بعرف الخبرية وين كنت وصرنا عايدين وهو اللي متمرة يمكن كنت ببيوت أنا بالأشرفية هلا أنا بالميل التاني من الأشرفية يعني من ميل الصوفي يعني فعليا محميين بالتل الأشرفية تل فمحميين بالتل بس برضو يعني طلع أول انفجار وكان قوي فنطيت كنا سوا كنت بالمكتب يعني عم بشتغل على الكمبيوتر بالبيت عندي عند عم بقودة مكتب عم بشتغل على الكمبيوتر لا بعد كم سنة طلع انفجار الثاني أو هو الثالث لأنه بيقولوا إنه في انفجار أول اللي خلى يصير في حريقة من بعد الحريقة طلع الانفجار الأول ورجع طلع الانفجار الثاني بعد ثلاث سنين أو بعد عشر سنين، فالانفجار الثاني كان كتير كبير صراحة يعني ما بالأول فكرت إنه هيدا هزة أرضية لأنه طاروا كل الغراض عن الطاولة كل شيء وراء كل شيء هذا كله صار على الأرض سمعت دبيك طلع إنه هيدا دبيك البويب بالقوض وبالمطبخ لحسن الحظ كنت أنا مفتح كل شيء لأنه دخن ف. ما تكسر إزاز بس تكسروا البويب يلي جوا يعني البويب الخشب يمكن لأنه ضربوا بال بالحيطان ما بع ما بعرف ليه بس تكسروا يعني كيف تكسروا بأفلام الرعب تشوف البيب البيب مفلوع بالنص مفتوح اثنين فا وتكنت بالأودة أول فكرة خطرة تعبيرة إنه بدروح تخبى طبعا رفلكس من الحرب انه بدأ تخبى ببيت الدرج لانه هيك كنا نتخبى ببيت الدرج محمي بالدرج من الاسانسور بالشقة اللي حواليك وبذات الوقت كان عم يخطر ببيري انه كان شوب كنت قاعد بالكالسون يعني او الكالسون عم بيقشي ف... فخطر ببيري انه لا لازم نروح على الاودة بالاول البس شي عليا قبل ما اظهر لانه هيك يعني اشي في سخيف الواحد تخطر ببيري لانه ما, ما مش مناسب ما كنا عم نعرف شو عم تصير So Tony uh, is really explaining how he felt, what he was doing at this moment. Uh, he's trying to stick to facts. And then um, each interview is about 20 minutes. And uh, then he will just say that he, he left. He left Beirut. He went to the mountains. And he became obsessed with fixing his house in, in Shub, fixing the electricity, fixing the internet, fixing the garden, trying to find a sense of... Uh, normality back to things on which he could have a control and then later come back to the city and see how he can he could just repair um, his house uh, the other one is very Sharif is very different and uh, and also you you will notice he will answer in French um. <coughs> Ce qui s'est passé le 4 août dans le port de Beyrouth, en fait ce qui s'est passé dans le port de Beyrouth s'est passé aussi à tous les points de la, de la ville. Je pense que ce qui s'est passé s'est passé surtout pour chacun d'entre nous, d'abord individuellement par le choc qui, que chacun a éprouvé sur le moment. Chacun d'entre nous, chacun des, des millions d'individus qui ont subi ce traumatisme, en fonction évidemment de son éloignement du port, 
elle a vécu en pensant qu'il était soi-même visé ou son quartier ou sa maison et évidemment c'est une chose qui a concerné chacun d'entre nous individuellement et directement euh, d'abord. Ensuite euh, individuellement et directement pour le traumatisme interne, intérieur, euh, dans le cadre duquel on n'est toujours pas sorti euh, deux mois après et euh, évidemment euh, à propos des, des dommages et des pertes et des deuils que beaucoup de gens ont subis. Donc ce qui s'est passé est d'abord hein, des drames individuels innombrables. Mais ensuite ce qui s'est produit est euh, au niveau national euh, quelque chose de spectaculaire, de terrifiant, mais que moi je considère avec le recul en fait, en y réfléchissant et en écrivant dessus, parce que j'ai été interrogé beaucoup sur ça, euh, c'est quelque chose dont on se demande si euh, on ne devait pas s'y attendre. En fait. C'est quelque chose qui s'est produit euh, et qui est le résultat, à mon avis, des 30 années euh, de mauvaise gestion, de gouvernance catastrophique de ce pays. Euh, et même à la limite de 100 années de, de catastrophique gouvernance d'un pays. Euh, Aujourd'hui, en 2020, en fait, nous fêtons deux anniversaires, très bizarrement. Le premier, c'est l'anniversaire de la fondation de l'État libanais moderne. Et nous fêtons en octobre quasiment... Euh, la fin de la guerre civile, les 30 années de guerre civile, donc 100 années de, de construction d'un État moderne et 30 années d'un après-guerre. Aussi bien les 30 années d'après-guerre que l'histoire moderne du Liban 60 ans euh, ont été finalement plutôt des, de véritables naufrages. So I encourage you, it's uh, online, the 27 testimonies, you can see it, but you see the different, the very different reactions, very different intellectual way of explaining uh, things. And, uh, and um, of course, for example, to Tony, they both agree that, and I'm quoting Tony later, there was a succession of decisions people made that destroyed the city, and someone has to bear responsibility. Um, and Shakar is asking himself, how can you mourn a city? Because you cannot bury a city. You can bury uh, human beings, but you cannot bury a city. Um, Um, and he also shares the thought that the artistic projects related to the blast need a sedimentation process. So it needs time to be processed in order then to be able to create something. And uh, in Mashdalani's uh, testimonial, um, he rejects the words resilience very heavily. And uh, he says it's a very controversial term we keep using when speaking of Lebanon and citizens, and that Lebanese are tired of being named. Uh, resilient uh, after the different chains of events that have happened over the last uh, century. And it's also a responsibility which is a collective. This is what uh, the, the end of the excerpt I, I was showing you. And then later he says, and I'm quoting, each Lebanese citizen has driven the country to a dead end. In my opinion, the first five seconds following the explosion really summarize the violence of everything that had been buried, repressed, accepted, and finally denied by all Lebanese. Gilbert Hage explained in an interview that he chose all these 27 people uh, through personal affinity because he appreciates their thinking, their voices, the high standard of their arti artistic practices, but also because they lived with force this blast of August 2020. Uh, he didn't want facts, he wanted truth. He wanted, uh, he says that facts and truths are not synonymous, and truth is about how people feel, how you feel and how you speak of something. This is truth, this is reality. And then he says that the other reality, you can find it on thousands of websites, and I'm not interested in them. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish in two minutes, Nada. Um, And the last one I just wanted to, to show you is um, this olive tree by uh, Abdul Rahman Katanani. And Katanani was born in 1983 in the Shabra Palestinian camp in West Beirut. And as a child, he started to collect uh, uh, garbage, barbed wire, corrugated iron, bottle caps that he would later in, in, incorporate into his artistic practice. So olive tree is a subject he started to shape in 2015 as a metaphor for his home country, Palestine, uh, a metaphor for displacement and resilience. So uh, it's not also so common that every, 
some artists are still using resilience as a term. His family left Jaffa and Haifa in 1948. They lived in the Lebanese overcrowded camp, and although, and although today he encourages his parents to move out of the camp and he even bought them a house, they cannot be away from the camp more than two days. Um, he took a symbol of the Mediterranean, the branches represent peace, yet it's entirely wrapped in barbed wire and uprooted. Uh, there was a much bigger version, but I couldn't have the image of this. Um, so I'm just showing you this uh, smaller version. And the artist is asking himself, what, are, what does it mean to have roots? Roots are complex and complicated. And I'm quoting, the roots of trees form an extraordinary system of communication with other trees. Are my roots Palestinian? Are they in Jaffa? Do my roots allow me to communicate with other Palestinians? End of quote. Um, but also there are these two elements of contradiction in his, the softness and the age of an olive tree compared to the vi violence and the corrosion of the barbed wire. Put around a living tree, the barbed wire acts like a parasite. It doesn't kill it, it doesn't prevent it from growing further and their fruits, but it just put it, uh, engage it into, um, into something. And to conclude, uh, in this quick overview um, done in the aftermath of the explosion, I try to understand how Lebanese and Palestinian artists in Lebanon are trying to keep a memory alive in a country wracked by amnesia, by building archives or recovering archives, by reflecting on the past, by being either highly creative on the contrary, retaining a kind of artlessness. They demonstrate how much geography matters in the area. I try to convey their different individual voices at a time crucial for the future of a country. How could one define the terms trauma, memory, identity? We have been using them repeatedly throughout this conference without really coining them because it would take us probably two days. I mean, uh, you spoke about Karouf, you spoke about Alvax, we could add many others, uh, offers, of course, and it's not, it's not today's thing. Um, maybe because we have tried to come to terms with the fluidity of a definition in our own research, and it would take too, much, too long maybe to agree on one. I can personally only wonder uh, what is Lebanese identity. When I was living there, people were telling me, you cannot understand, you're not Lebanese. Um, and we don't even understand it. So to finish it, it's more like, uh, is it, what is it actually, this Lebanese identity? Beyond resilience, beyond sectarianism, beyond the constitution inherited from the French mandate, I think it still needs to be defined. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Hamid, for the invitation. Um, and thank you, Mabella, for being here. <laughs> um, in this presentation, I make the claim that Reza Aramesh's art brings forward a particular ethic in which the viewer is confronted not only with their awareness of the history of Christian iconography, such as in the Venetian early modern paintings of Saint Sebastian, but also with the reality of a contemporary subject, often migrant, male, and non-Western. I also argue that while the depiction of war victims tends to focus on the group or the collective, Aramesh's artwork uh, focuses on the individual and I carry out an analysis of his artistic strategies of cropping, isolating figures, and what I call creative conscription, a process of rewriting space, or images. I'm going to skip over these and I'll come back to them um, after, afterwards. I'll, I'll just start there. Um, 
Let me begin by narrating an exhibition um, since I arrive at this topic as a curator. I recently curated Reza Armish's solo exhibition number 207 at the Chiesa di San Fantin on the Campo San uh, Fantin near the famous Teatro La Fenice in San Marco, Venice. Armesh is a prolific artist with decades of worth of art practice. The British and Iranian artist lives in London, where his, sol where his studio is based, um, but continues to work in other cities, including New York. His work has been described by critic and curator Murtaza Vali as, quote, extracting victims' poses, gestures, and expressions, unquote. His attention is on the history of photography, that concerns war reportage as well as the history of early modern Italian Spanish painting and sculpture. I produced a scenographic sketch of a triangle shape that was emerging from the presentation of three monumental marble sculptures. Each of the sculptures were part of Aramesh's recent work, Site of the Fall, a study in the Renaissance Garden, Action 498, Action 245, and Action 218. I had produced a sketch um, that created a kind of procession uh, where Action 218 sat at the apse of the church, facing the absent congregation, as it were, and the entrance of the church being the first thing you saw, and where Action 498 and Action 245 stood directly facing each other, close to the church's side exit doors, secondary, altars, and the confessionals. The middle of the church had a long procession on either side of the study of sweat cloth as an object of desire, a group of 207 marble underwear sculptures. Viewers of the exhibition would walk down an aisle as if they were prison guards inspecting prisoners, while an audio piece played from the speakers naming the sites and locations cited in each of the 200 plus marble sculptures often named were prisons or sites of conflict. The exhibition sketch formed thus a steep triangle between the three monumental male figure marble sculptures from site of the fall. While making this sketch, I was not entirely aware that I was reproducing a common idea of thirds that is prevalent in realist painting of the early modern period. Art historian, um, I'll just return to these. Um, Art historian uh, Ernst Gombrich um, described the triangle shape and its appearance in early modern painting as a struggle with realism and the particular attention to design, drawing a comparison between Da Vinci's Last Supper and um, Paolo Iolo's The Martyrdom of Saint Sebastian. Gombrich wrote, quote, there is so much order in this variety and so much variety in this order that one can never quite exhaust the harmonious interplay of movement and answering movement. Um, the art historian's poetic phrasing um, was drawing from music theory, um, where the sense of harmony and discord, as well as the interplay of movement and rhythm. Gombrich's focus on call and response is also a reference to music theory in the styles of choral or folk music. Um, he talked about the thirds in terms of a sense of rhythm characterized by da Vinci's groups of three and Palawiolo's steep triangle depicting Saint Sebastian and the group of antagonists. Because these early modern approaches to painting have become standards, even curatorially, this interplay between the three figures and the rule of thirds was important for our exhibition number 207. So by emphasizing on the rule of thirds as a standard of early modern painting, I also refer to Reza Aramish's own interest and inspiration from early modern painting and sculpture, as well as what I, I, I find to be a technique that is prevalent in Aramish's art practice in his use of techniques of cropping that, iso that create isolation within the composition. Though this tendency of cropping operates more prevalently in photography and printmaking, Cropping is a visual strategy of isolating figures in order to highlight them or cut and paste them into another composition. And that's, I feel, what's happening um, in these, um, um, especially in these drawings here. Um, 
one will often recall the floating heads in print that have been cropped or the cropped heads um, or bodies juxtaposed with lettering and other design elements appearing in various media. Cropping as a visual strategy also shows this struggle between design and realism, given that cropping produces what appear to be surreal images. Cropping will usually, pardon me, um, Uh, the question of crop cropping is therefore more about content than it is about um, than it is about the scene or the beauty in composition, but I view it as consistent with Aramesh's idea of emphasizing the individual as well as the phenomenological. The individual in Aramesh's art is a complex subject, not merely a stereotype or character of reportage imagery, not merely a victim. Um, his approach he aims. Um, is to highlight or make relevant the individual person and to decontextualize the image in order to rewrite its content. Um, and in some ways, that's what I feel is happening with this um, sketch as well. Um, in this presentation, my aim has not been to um, provide an entirely new study of St. Sebastian, which I cannot do, I'm not qualified to do that, but rather it has been to consider the ways that this nude male figure um, sustaining our head wounds uh, relates to the work of Reza Aramesh. Um, Aramesh's uh, interest in the history of early modern painting can at least be traced to his, to his making of polychrome wooden sculptures and his 2011 exhibition at Malibon Church in Westminster titled Those Who Dwell on the Earth. According to the artist, he produced these sculptures after visiting the exhibition The Sacred Made Real, Spanish painting and sculpture 1600 to 1700, curated by Xavier Bray at the National Gallery of London in 2010, where he saw works like Gregorio Fernandez's Dead Christ. Um, French-born Venetian painter Nicolas Regnier, whose artwork on Saint Sebastian attended by Saint Irene, a painting from 1600s, shows three figures with Saint Sebastian laying down in the nude, and Saint Irene helping to nurse his body by removing the arrows. It's fragments of, of something like this, but this is not the painting exactly. Um, the idea here concerns how Regnier um, creates a composition that extends the musical rhythmic qualities of earlier modern artwork such as in Da Vinci and others. Similarly, um, there is a motif of the third. Um, yet, in, in its, it is interesting to see um, that other prominent studies, such as this one, um, by the same Venetian painter, um, rather than follow groupings of three figures, use um, specifically one figure or isolate Saint Sebastian almost entirely, reminding me of how Reza Aramesh actually uh, crops, you know, images, or how it, this is done in modern photography. So what, what might it mean to crop the body of Saint Sebastian intentionally and, and to isolate it within the frame? The details surrounding Saint Sebastian as a Christian figure of the Catholic Church are well known. His suffering is as revered as the suffering of other uh, Christian saints and martyrs. However, what is pointed out in the literature is that, the, that these Venetian painters and the early modern artists produced realist paintings that displayed his, quote, boyish beauty, and therefore that these paintings were also homoerotic. Um, that with a combination of a figure who is suffering is one of the enduring, um, as well as an enduring physical torture of death by arrows, is what inspired artists and writers for centuries. My understanding of this figure's role within Reza Aramesh's artwork has to do with the artist's own fascination with ideas of torture and captivity. Often, he was a student of the history of photography within which he looked for and found images of tortured victims of war. These were ordinary men who were held captive in places and borders across the globe. The artist has said to me that his collection of such archival reportage images consists of about 2,000 items. And you can see, you can see in this image some of those materials. 
of which he has recorded the dates, places, and, and circumstances in which the prisoners were photographed. Um, this interest and fixation on the captive is one that is in, intended to be autobiographical as much as it is historical or archival. The facts are historical facts as much as they can also become stories through which the artist re-narrates the picture, often by cropping the others out. Like in this is a video in which the artist actually cropped everybody else out and left this one singular figure. Um, often, yes, cropping out and leaving the lone prisoner or the captive. The artist has told me more than once that he is the person in the photograph, although this is not an objective point when he says that he is the person. Um, um, he also, I mean, I always think about his journey from Iran to Britain as a young man, and then his life as a migrant, and how that has shaped his worldview. And therefore, while we can claim to be objective in a positivist attitude about when studying which images the artist has appropriated and which art history he has borrowed from, um, what the artist ultimately wants from the viewer is ethical. Um, he's not interested in our analysis, our art historical analysis. He's really interested in how these images can make us feel something or can confront us with what we know and what we do not know. Um, the perspective varies greatly from that of critic and curator Mutaza Valley, who reviewed Arameshi's solo show at Leila Hela Gallery in 2014. In his review, Valley characterized Aramesh's artwork, Action 136, put this in your record, I am present, um, a 35 millimeter film transferred to digital file as the artist's attempt at, quote, extracting victims' poses, gestures, expressions, then enlisting amateurs, young, fit, and dressed in everyday streetwear to reenact them, unquote. This kind of positivist attitude to the history of photography within which every figure is a reportage image from the archive, um, and that figure is a victim whose life is merely extracted by the artist, um, provides what is plausibly an accurate description, but falls short of naming the artist as immoral. Um, and by this I mean that calling um, um, Reza Aramesh, somebody who appropriates images of Middle Eastern men uh, in his artwork as something to the equivalent of theft. Um, instead, Aramesh calls on a strategy that I have conceptualized as creative conscription to revise and re-narrate and retell a scene or a place and effectively placing a new mandate into its visual context. Art historian Geraldine Johnson describes it this way. Aramesh's art is an art of decontextualization and recontextualization. In Aramesh's sketches for his embroidery artworks, again, I'll just go back to these um, part of the embroidery artworks, we see a variety of captive figures who are isolated in the frame. They appear in clothing and in various configurations, mostly with their heads covered entirely and with their hands tied. Behind these figures are armed guards and with what appear to be military weapons and military outfits. Um, the artist positions the captives in colored pen, whereas the figures in the background are blacked out. This is another way that the artist uses strategies of cropping. In the video work Action 136, we also see this strategy since the other figures have been cropped out of the video itself, as I said earlier, and the captive appears here quite prominently, walking alone with his hands tied behind his back and what looks like an advanced war machinery in the background. Art historian Geraldine Johnson tends to describe Aramesh's position as working from the idea or narrative of the Renaissance or Baroque masters, particularly Italian and Spanish painters. She cites Michelangelo, Bernini, Velasquez, uh, Caravaggio. Johnson's project and approach is based on a focus, um, sorry, of, on a reading of early modern painting and sculpture and its relationship to photography. 
um, her project is also an exploration of the notion of photographing sculpture. Um, so art historian has published, she has published two very detailed extensive essays in Aramish, one for the Malibun One Church Exhibition in 2011, titled Those Who Dwell on Earth, on the Earth, and a 2024 essay published in Action by Number, um, the monograph on the artist, which I edited. Um, her analysis, which takes a strong interest in Aramesh's own photography practice as it relates to his image research, into photographic archives in addition to his sculptural practice. And her idea of sculptural photographs is borrowed from German art historian Heinrich Welflin, um, particularly from an 1896 article. Um, it's in German, so I, I'll not read it. Um, so um, just to summarize, and I'll show you uh, some of these marble sculptures really quickly. Um, so these are some of the marble sculptures that Reza Aramesh has produced um, since the year 2011. And these are polychrome uh, wooden sculptures, but he has gone on to produce marble um, sculptures. Um, and often the figures are isolated, they are in pain or visibly in pain. Um, and they're very lifelike, and um, uh, that is the work that he has been producing. So my focus on creative conscription was to think of it um, via the act of rewriting space and rewriting, or rewriting and revision. Conscription has something to do with the transfer of space by assigning new mandates to a space or an image. I would not want to dwell on this, um, though I've attempted to think through this concept at the level of writing and how writing begins to intersect with forms of legislation as well as forms of administry. So I use creative conscription to speak about how artists use strategies like performance, appropriation, or reenactment um, to rewrite the meaning of a space or an image, and by doing so, these artists also begin to exercise a particular kind of power or authority. Though Reza is not a Renaissance artist, he uses those images as if he were the artist and he produces something entirely different from what a Renaissance artist would make. So this is what I'm, I'm arguing. In, in Reza Aramesh's uh, case, um, such as when he produces exhibitions in spaces um, like the Malibon churches in Westminster, there's definitely a sense that these spaces formerly reserved for the British upper classes are transferred via the artist's appropriation of their historical context. And his conscription of the space into a different mandate, one that serves the migrant or even working classes. Right. Additionally, I'm interested in thinking about the concept of creative conscription through the lens of reenactment because we learned from Geraldine Johnson that this is one of the attributes of Aramesh's art where she talks about how his use of reenactment, especially um, his um, reenacting of specific poses and choreographic movements from the paintings of Caravaggio so I, as I said earlier, I do not fully agree with Mutaza Vali's uh, curator, critic Mutaza Vali's um, comments on Reza Aramesh's art, which talk about um, you know the victims in his artwork um, and his extraction of victims' lives. Um, instead, I prefer to consider Aramesh's artwork through the lens that this is an artist with a worldview that informs his artwork. I think it's important to think about artists' own worldview, not specifically that of the historian or that of the scientist or whatever you may have. Right? Um, and, um, and that worldview is also one of an, a migrant. Um, it's one of having lived outside Iran for decades, and it is one that is autobiographical. You know, he's also um, a homosexual man, and that also informs his 
um, his his sculpture specifically. So um, the subjective experience, in short, of the captive appears in his artwork, but he aims less for the objective view, the facts of telling the hist all the historical facts, and rather his gesturing towards the ethical. So to conclude, I think, um, in the context of St. Sebastian, um, Aramesh's art does the same thing, where in spite of the many artists who have used the trope of St. Sebastian, the man tied to a tree and sustaining wounds from the attack of arrowheads, Aramesh practices a, a particular kind of creative conscription where this popularized iconography becomes rewritten. No longer is it only merely Christian, and no longer can it remain only homoerotic. Instead, Aramesh transfers these 17th century realist paintings of Saint Sebastian into new mandates of which call for an ethics. And I'm calling it, it's really that the, art, the artist is asking you uh, or confronting you with these images and you know, uh, confronting you with his own personal reality, right? It's, on, it's not only an ethics of recognition, but it, is also, it also calls for us to expand and seriously reconsider our sense of aesthetic and moral judgment of other human beings. And so it's not, as I said, um, just about what he is referencing or who he is referencing. It's also about him as an individual and, and his experience, where he has come from and how that is communicated uh, through his artwork. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of our speakers. And um, let's see, we have actually about 20 minutes uh, for discussion and questions. So, um, Right here. Um, hi, thank you very much to both speakers. I wanted to start in reverse by saying, especially to um, um, is it Dr. or Professor Moses, uh, I really appreciate your comment on, on taking the point of um, the artist's worldview as being um, kind of um, a, 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 an overarching way of understanding what they're doing rather than just kind of like doing, dissecting it into the um, more specific details um, of, of just, you know, where they're from and identity and so on. But I wanted to mention this in connection with what um, uh, Professor Delacour mentioned or talked about Beirut, it's actually very difficult to listen and hear anything about Beirut at the moment because we're in a much more existential moment where it's almost very difficult to breathe. Um, and a lot of the things that have been mentioned are almost like too, I mean, given the, the scope of the um, destruction, of the apoc apocalypse right now seem kind of small in comparison. But I just wanted to mention, particularly with regards to the first two artists, um, Munira Soloh and uh, Lamia Jresh. Um, I think if I may just make comments, because I know them both and I'm um, very familiar with, um, with their practices, is I think it's very important to mention when you talk about Munira, Munira is from Saida. And Saida is um, where Europa, where the story of Europa started. And that's something that is, I mean, wasn't mentioned, I know that it may not be a relevant point, but I think it's very important because of Munira's way of looking at the world. Um, and in connection with that, I just wanted to make a small, um, it's not a correction, but, but when you talked about the fact that many Lebanese think of themselves as being Phoenician, I think it was important to also mention that it's very much part of the sectarian drama, so that in fact it is Christian Lebanese Maronites that call themselves Phoenician, as opposed to all the other confessions. And that's part of the problem of how we relate to the identity of what is Le Grand Liban and the narrative of Lebanon. With regards to um, Lamia, who, by the way, is half Palestinian on her um, mother's side. I mean, her mother is Palestinian. 
um, is the fact that um, you talked about um, the, the famine and the period of the First World War in, in Lebanon, which I just want to add that although there was a low cost um, in, you know, um, onslaught and, and there was famine, that the famine was also triggered and not uniquely only because Mount Lebanon is occupied by Druze as well as by Maronites and there were lots of people on the coast and I, I know this from my own research uh, who, were, who died of hunger is the fact that there was also a naval blockade um, by the British on, Ottoman, um, on the Ottoman army, I mean the navy, that, that was prevented any, anything coming into the country. So I think that's a very, very operative point as to why the famine also happened. Sorry, it's long-winded, but thank you very much. Thank you very much for your thoughtful comments. I think first... Okay, that's all right. That's okay. Drew is my... Uh, th thanks both. Thank you very much. But there is something very interesting between what you have been saying, both of you, uh, whether we're talking about testimony or self-reflection um, when we're dealing with an artist's work. Um, and uh, I was wondering how you can um, think, both of you, about what's, uh, what is self-reflexive and what is testimony and what is... Uh, does does the artist speak in a subaltern world? Uh, words. So, if he if he does, then what is? Are we? It is just is it just testimony, or is it something that goes beyond testimony? Uh, um, and then it is in dialogue with uh, culture, uh, with uh, um, presupposed categories of uh, understanding his work. It's very, very tricky, and I think there is something in between. Um, no, you're right. So uh, it's not pure testimonies, of course. I think, um, well, I've started my research on Beirut in 2007, and some of my conclusions were that the artist actually mediates or feels for an entire neighborhood or an entire community and through his voice can actually give this back not only to an international audience but also a very local audience. So I think there is this way of conveying testimonies that are, uh, can become, of course, beyond uh, testimonies. Yeah, thank you, Joyce, for that uh, question. Um, I, I, don't, I haven't really thought I guess so much about uh, reflex self-reflexivity, um, but I think that um, from what I know from working with Re Reza Aramish, um, is that he's com his high is combated is combated by critics, uh, by you know curators who misunderstand his his work, what he's trying to achieve. Um, he, I, I don't mean to say that he's he's sustaining all this abuse. I mean to just say that there's a lot that is leveled against him merely for being bold enough to work with certain images. Of course, I'm not showing you the rep reportage images, but they're very shocking as well. Um, and I think that uh, it's important for me to, to say that, you know, he himself has a position, right? Uh, as a critic, you're not even thinking that the artist has a position, but he, he does have a position. Um, and but as regards to whether he can speak, I, you know, I think the best thing I would say is that his sense of speaking is to be antagonistic to to curators and critics. He, he's very, very, um, very antagonistic because he wants to defend, uh, you know, the, what he believes to be the meaning of his work, um, and he doesn't want anyone else to think that they know it better than he does. I have a question uh, for Isabel. Uh, it's in continuation with the same uh, line of question that Dries presented. Um, it seemed in the beginning that the art is a commentary on reality or in history. And um, we were 
talking about um, you know the art as a, a knowledge production process but uh, as a knowledge production process it's not uh, reducible to knowledge produced by other media so what is that media and art and there is uh, the almost uh, uh, hated word uh, aesthetics so what are the aesthetic dimensions that you find or the style that you find in these commentaries on reality on the Marfa uh, Beirut on uh, the history is there some kind of uh, aesthetic beyond the content of the works themselves that is in my opinion carries the knowledge in a different way or in a different experience thank you um, I I think I well you you aware of the fiction of archives which was uh, in the 2000 years in Lebanon, which was very, very active with Walid Rad, with Khalid uh, Shorej, uh, Joanna Hamid Ajitoma, Lamia Shorej. And it seems like we are, um, at the time, there was this kind of uh, artlessness, meaning that uh, people, this kind of was almost, it, it became almost an, asth an aesthetic at, at the time, and it was uh, coined uh, as such. Now, even artists which were working in art, with this artlessness or this artlessness way of, uh, um, of making art seem to be more productive. I mean, Lamia Jorich came back to drawings, uh, which was her primary practice when she was a student and in her first years after, after her studies. And she finds it extremely important to include her own interventions, not through questioning people in videos and so on, but to make really visual, aesthetic uh, comments and, um, and interventions into, um, into her artworks. And I think, and maybe you would, you would agree that Mulira is also in this kind of, of things that you take a myth, a reality, uh, something which is really profoundly linked to the history of a country, and then you add your own aesthetics by drawings, by turning things also around in, in some way. And I think this is where the, the, the core, the artistic core really lies. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Hi. Um, my question is for uh, Moses. Um, just with Reza's um, art, I wonder if you've had any reflections with him. Um, I think we live in a time where like, we're seeing a lot more um, visceral, physical imagery on conflict and war. You know, we have so much access to what's happening in different parts of the world, and we're seeing this imagery and just like reflecting on how that's impacting on his work because he's also kind of producing these different or curating these images. And um, what's his reflection on what people have access to? Is that affecting how people are reacting to his work? Is it making people less um, emotionally impacted? Like, have you had any reflections about what people are exposed to now um, and what his art kind of represents or is depicting? Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, Mavala. I think, um, I think he, he, well, I think he's, he's always, He's always researching these kind of images. I think, you know, he very late at night watches uh, documentaries that are shot in like, you know, prisons and torture chambers and things like this. He's kind of literally obsessed with um, this sort of like archive of of really um, ter like torture uh, material. Um, uh, but I think that he is also aware of the fact that um, we live in a time, as you said, where um, war seems to be closer to, to us than, than ever before. Um, and I, I think he's, since he's been working on it for so long, actually, I think he's a little suspicious of how we, can, we, um, how we, how we look at those those specific images. As I said, for him, it's always like, 
he goes back to this process of isolating like the individuals in them and kind of re rewriting them almost according to his own feelings. But I think he, in some ways, I think he's quite suspicious of whether or not we can connect to those images of war or terror. Um, and it's, it is a challenge. I think it's, they're difficult images, literally. They're not easy. So, um, But in terms of what he would want for us to do or like how, he, how his work is changing according to the, the current sort of moment, um, I think he's not necessarily changing his work. I feel that he's just... Um, I feel like he's just becoming somehow uh, more under, like aware of how much more people are paying attention to these specific kinds of images. And, and I think maybe it helps because he's been working on that for a long time. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much again, it's for you. Um, um, I couldn't really understand when you were talking why you slipped in the fact that he was gay at the very, very end of your talk, rather than saying it at the beginning, because even the Xavier Bray exhibition was an incredibly gay exhibition, for starters, and it's the sort of thing where one would immediately go for that, uh, that interpretation. And... And then it seems to me, but I don't, I mean, obviously I've got to investigate his work and discover more of it. It seems to me that the video pieces, which are taking us out of whatever his contemporary scene is in London, are, are, are a huge rupture and a huge exploration of a different practice that one could retrospectively see as a, a critique of a certain introspective practice. Also, um, the early St. Sebastian paintings, which turn on so many male, you know, young male art historians, are very different from those reduced, wooden, um, almost Ron Mook-like, yeah. um, peculiarly scaled things that he was copying in some ways. So um, maybe you could just clarify that moment of rupture um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Sarah. I think um, he, th here's the thing. So I'm, I'm actually being put in the spot to kind of guess what he might respond to <laughs> or how he might speak, which I'm, I'm also unable to do because I'm, I'm not the artist. But um, I, I do think that his video works are very different from his sculptural works. And um, at the same time, I also think that the whole fascination with St. Sebastian um, seems to be a trope uh, or something of that sort. Like, uh, like it's, it's something that is um, like what people call camp, you know? It's a cliche. It's a cliche, exactly. So I don't necessarily s lead with, uh, with that notion. I think I'm more interested in how, for example, you know, he isolates certain images or how he treats those um, uh, realist paintings than in the cliche of the man who is tied to a tree who is being either eaten by dogs or shot by arrows, you know. Yeah. Um, hi. Hey. Yeah. Um, That's the last question. Sure. Um, this question is also for Moses, but... Um, in, in more general terms, uh, I really appreciated how you advocated for Riz's work and, and his own you know, ideas and in, in what, what he wants to represent, not what others see in his work. Um, but my question comes from a point of view as a curator, a researcher, and a writer. Like, how do you give an artwork its own breathing space um, and respect the artist's views and ideas that they put into their artwork, but also take that artwork and also mesh it into different perspectives and um, different um, kind of contexts of different exhibitions. So how, where do you find that balance and where do you kind of speak for the artist but also let the artist breathe, especially in contexts where the artists aren't around anymore um, and so on and so forth, so thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I, I really think it's about um, respecting the artist. And I say this not like uh, meekly. I'm, I'm, I'm not a meek person. Uh, um, I'm not really intimidated by artists at all. I've worked with over 100 of them. Um, I, I think it's about literally literally having a dialogue with the artist where you understand that that artist is the lead in that dialogue and not the, the other way around. So I can have ideas about Reza Aramish's work, but if I'm not able to come to terms with him clearly, then I don't think I can really curate an exhibition of his. Um, because this is somebody whose work is so intensely personal. I think this, this is when things started to, to click for me is when I started to understand how personal the work is. It seems very universal, like you look at the work like, oh, I, I know what this is, or I've seen that in a certain kind of context, or I think I understand. But it's so intensely personal. So once I understood that, I was like, okay, I need to spend more time with him and just kind of have a conversation that's not me telling him, this is what your art is about but just kind of him guiding me, like where does this go? How do we, and I, in that way, I started to create um, an exhibition or a series of writings or uh, kind of theses or uh, statements, and I would test them on him. And he would very quickly say no, if he felt that that's not, that's not representative of, of me and my work. <laughs> like what? He's very much, very vocal. So I think it's just being able to respect the artist enough as a, and again, it's this question of that Dries pointed out, you know, yesterday as someone producing who is, can also produce an opinion that is worth listening to, right? So this is really what I would say. I'm gonna exercise my power as the chair of this panel and say the last word. Something to discuss during lunch maybe. As an art historian who will always tell my students that, yes, the artist is important, and I mean, you know, I'm kind of surprised by the, the discussion a little bit because, I mean, did we sort of now neglected the artist as an important part of the conversation? I, I fear that maybe we have, and this is why there is this reaction. So, you know, we can discuss this further, but um, I mean, you know, when we talk about, um, Art as a production of knowledge, I assume that we by no means are leaving the opinion of the artist, um, the feeling of the artist as part, you know, uh, out of that uh, conversation. But it is a mediation between, you know, the what the artist wants, the artist's intention, and then you know what um, we as critics and, and historians are are looking in the work and um, understanding it. And that's all I'm going to say, and we can discuss this over lunch. Please come back. Uh, thank you very much for both of our speakers and for the questions. Uh, please come back at 1.20 for um, the rest of um, the panels for today. We have two panels and then closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you.